welcome to another video in my questions about Anne Boleyn series. Um, this today is part two of the series that I'm doing on Mary Boleyn. I know she's not Anne Boleyn, but obviously whenever I ask for questions about Anne Boleyn, I also receive questions about you know, her family, Mary, George, Thomas, Henry VIII. So it's going to be, you know, broader than just Anne. Thank you so much for all the comments that you left me on the first part, um, Mary Boleyn part one. Um, if you haven't seen that video, then I will share a link, or in fact, you can probably look around about here. It might just be there for you to uh, click on and watch it later, but I'll share a link in the description as well. Now in that video, I explained that we actually know very little about uh, Mary Boleyn. I did have one comment about, well, if we know so little about her, how come you know biographies have been written about her? Well, as is the case with many Tudor characters where their life is a little bit shadowy, um, when someone writes a biography about them because the, the figure fascinates people, they, they share what we do know, they share their theories about them and suppositions, and then they also look at the broader, kind of their broader context, the times they lived in, how it might have been when they got married, what their wedding might have been like, um, you know, what was happening at the royal court at the time, and it's if I say padded out, that, that's not kind of fair. That sounds a criticism. But it's more about, you know, them and t their time. So that's how biographies have been written about her. And I don't blame people for writing biographies about her because she is, you know, she's a fascinating character and lots of people are interested in her. But we know very little about her. What, um, what we think we know isn't actually factual. It's it's mostly grown from fiction and from TV, uh, from movies and from assumptions that have been made. Assumptions and myths and theories have become facts. They've grown into facts and they're not facts at all. So in that video, part one, I shared what we do know about her, some Mary Boleyn facts. Now in this video and the next video, I'm going to look at some of the stories that have grown up around her, some of the theories about her, some of the myths about her, and just see if there is actually any basis for them in history. Look at what the evidence says. So, okay, it is often said that Mary Boleyn was the mistress of two kings. The two kings being King Francis I of France and his contemporary King Henry VIII of England. Both were kings at the same time. And there's this, you know, it is said that Mary Boleyn was the mistress of two kings. Is there any basis to that? What does history say? Well, I'm going to look at what the historians and authors who state this as fact what they actually cite as their sources, because that's what historians do in their books. It's what I've done in my books as well as an author. I cite my sources. You can look at the references to see what I based my views on, what I back up the facts with, what historical evidence there is. So we have a letter written by Rodolfo Pio in March 1536. Um, now, he was the papal nuncio in France, and he said, he was writing in 1536 about um, Anne Boleyn's miscarriage that she had in January 1536, and he says that that woman, i.e. Anne Boleyn, pretended to have miscarried of a son, not being really with child, and to keep up the deceit would allow no one to attend on her but her sister, whom the French king knew here in France, per una grandissima ribalda et infame sopre tutte, which means, and that was probably very badly uh, pronounced, it means a great prostitute and infamous above all. 
So he's saying that Anne Boleyn didn't really have a miscarriage and she managed to cover up the fact that she wasn't really pregnant in the first place by having her sister alone attend on her. And that sister was known by the French king, as in known, as in sexually known, as a great prostitute, infamous above all. Then we have Nicholas Sander. Uh, In his 1585 book, Rise and Growth of the Anglican Schism, which is all about the uh, break with Rome. And he, he is a Catholic writing about it, in which he writes, Soon afterwards, she appeared at the French court where she was called the English Mayor because of her shameless behaviour, and then the royal mule when she became acquainted with the King of France. And then the third source we have is Lord Herbert of Cherbury. Now, he was writing in the 17th century, so later, but he was quoting from a 16th century source from Thomas More's biography written by William Rastall. Now, William Rastall had uh, said that uh, Anne Boleyn was sent to France where, and this is Anne Boleyn, where she behaved herself so licentiously that she was vulgarly called the hackney of England till being adopted to that king's familiarity, she was termed his mule. So you can kind of see that Nicholas Sander and uh, William Rastall are saying the same thing there. They're saying that she, uh, you know, she was the royal mule. Now, I have concerns about these three sources, and I believe that all three of them can be totally dismissed. This is my reasoning, and it's my reasoning. Rodolfo Pio, the first one that was writing, actually at the time in March 1536, he was a papal nuncio, as I said, at the court of Francis I. And being papal of the papacy, of the Pope, he was very biased against the evangelical Berlins, who had obviously played their part in the break with Rome. Who he, he believed they were, you know, they were the cause of the break from Rome and the break from the authority of the Pope. And his contempt for Anne Boleyn is shown in the way he doesn't even call her the Queen or Queen Anne. He calls her that woman. So it's not a very respectful sort of reference. But also, his report is downright inaccurate. We know from other sources that, uh, from people on the ground in England, that Anne Boleyn definitely did have a miscarriage in January 1536. The imperial ambassador, Eustace Chapuis, who also shows his contempt for Anne Boleyn by calling her the concubine quite often in his dispatches, he stated that she miscarried a male child which she had not born three and a half months. And there is no suggestion anywhere else that Anne Boleyn wasn't really pregnant and that she covered up this miscarriage. And there is also no suggestion in any of the other sources that her sister attended on her when she miscarried, that her sister was even serving her in 1536. So I think we can dismiss Rodolfo Pio completely. But then we have Nicholas Sander and William Rastel. Now, what we have here is they are actually writing about Anne Boleyn, not Mary. They're saying that Anne Boleyn was the royal mule, that she uh, you know, she slept with the, the French king. She had a, uh, a bad reputation in France, and then it followed her back to England. Now, some historians have assumed that because their comments aren't really about Anne, they're not accurate about Anne, because, for example, they have Anne Boleyn being sent to France at the wrong time, at the wrong age, and Nicholas Sander has Anne Boleyn sleeping with her father's chaplain and butler and then being sent to France because, you know, she's shamed the family. Because those, you know, the rest of it's not accurate, they think that perhaps they're confused and they're really talking about Mary. They've got muddled up. But I don't think that makes sense. These writers were focusing on Anne because, um, for example, Nicholas Sander was attempting to blacken Anne's name because he was attacking Elizabeth I. He was a Catholic in exile in Elizabeth I's reign. And Elizabeth was the daughter of Anne Boleyn. His, his whole book... Is, is blackening uh, Anne and Elizabeth and 
Protestantism in England. So they're trying to, William Rastell as well, who uh, sort of blames Anne for the fall of Sir Thomas More, um, they're, they're attempting to damage Anne's reputation. So there we have two sources that aren't even writing about Mary Boleyn, and one source, Rudolfo Pio, that isn't accurate and isn't credible. So I think that it is safe to say that probably, and highly probably, Mary Boleyn didn't sleep with King Francis I of France. Um, I don't think we should make an assumption that she did. I don't think there's any evidence. But what about the English king? What about Henry VIII? So if we can dismiss or pour doubt on the idea that Mary Boleyn was the French king's mistress, what about the English king? What about Henry VIII? What does history say? Well, actually here, history does back up this idea. In 1527, following Anne Boleyn's acceptance of his marriage proposal, King Henry VIII applied to the Pope for a dispensation uh, to marry her, to marry another woman. Uh, okay, he was married to Catherine of Aragon at the time, but he applied to the Pope for a dispensation. Now, he needed this dispensation for the impediment of affinity arising from illicit intercourse in whatever degree, even the first. Now, to explain what that means, it, that means that he wanted to marry a woman with whose very, very close uh, female relative uh, in the first degree, so mother or sister, he'd already had a sexual relationship with. So he's saying, we know that dispensation, he doesn't name Anne, but we know that it was about Anne because she had accepted his proposal here. So this dispensation covers him sleeping with either her mother or her sister, and therefore, therefore being kind of related to Anne in that. Now, we know that he's referring to Mary, Anne's sister, and not Elizabeth Howard, who was Anne's mother, because Sir George Throckmorton, for example, told the king that it was rumoured that he had meddled both with the mother and the sister, and Henry replied, never with the mother. He didn't say never with the mother and never with the sister. What's she talking about? Never with the mother. We also have other sources. We have, for example, the imperial ambassador um, at Rome, Dr. Pedro Ortiz, stating in 1533 that the king had asked for a dispensation to marry Anne, notwithstanding the affinity between them on account of his having committed adultery with her sister. Charles V, the Holy Roman Emperor, spoke to one of Henry VIII's ambassadors in 1530, saying that the said king had kept company with the sister of her whom he now, it was stated, wanted to marry. Then we have good old Eustace Shapri, the imperial ambassador, saying that even if he could separate from the queen, Catherine of Aragon, he could not have her, Anne, for he has had to do with her sister, and then Cardinal Pole, another source, um, he wrote a treatise against Henry VIII in um, around 1538, where he accused Henry of seducing Mary Boleyn and then with retaining her as his mistress. So we've got lots of sources to back up the idea that the dispensation was to do with Henry VIII having had a sexual relationship with Mary Boleyn, not Elizabeth Howard. So I think it is safe to say that Mary did indeed sleep with the English king, Henry VIII. But when and how long did this go on for? I mean, fiction has sort of made out that they have this long romance, that she truly loved him, he truly loved her. It went on for years and that he fathered her children. But is that true? Well, this is when Mary frustratingly uh, goes back to being that shadowy figure once more. Really, really frustrating. All we know, and we only know it because of this impediment and then the resulting, you know, ambassadors talking about it, the impediment and the dispensation. All we know is that Henry VIII and Mary Boleyn 
had sex sometime and at least once. That's all we can say. Now, historians and authors often date the start of this love affair uh, to the time around the Shrovetide joust of the 2nd of March, 1522. At this joust, uh, Henry VIII rode out with, um, you know, beautifully, beautifully apparelled and with beautiful trappings on his horse and with a motto sort of emblazoned on, on his trappings and that. It was the motto, El mon coeur a nevera, or she has wounded my heart. This motto has been taken to mean that the king was in love with someone and that he was wooing a woman who had thus far uh, rebuffed his advances. Now, perhaps a woman had, um, but how can we be sure that it's Mary in this instance? He hasn't said Mary Boleyn has wounded my heart. Uh, And Mary Boleyn was by this time married to William Carey. She'd married him in 1520, so she'd been married two years. Um, And how can we even be sure that this um, motto wasn't just a theme that, um, you know, the, the person in charge of the entertainments for Shrove Tide, um, there wasn't a master of rebels at the time, but it, loosely um, a person was in charge. Um, how can we be sure that it wasn't a motto that they decided on for, you know, the pageants and the jousts? It might have just been a theme and had no bearing on the king's love life. Now, further evidence... Uh, to support this timing for the king's affair, which historians use, and with the the idea that um, Henry fathered um, Mary's children, Catherine Carey, born in 1524, and Henry Carey, born in 1526, or at least Catherine. Some historians, you know, say Catherine was his child, but Henry, Henry wasn't. Evidence that's used to back that up is the timing of rewards that were given to Mary's husband, William Carey, um, as they see them as kind of payments for the use of his wife and, uh, you know, payments to support the children. Um, So these are grants and offices that the king awarded William Carey between 1522, you know, the timing of this joust, and William Carey's death from sweating sickness in 1528. Now, it is true that Carey received many lucrative grants and offices. Um, You can look these up for yourself in Letters and Papers, Foreign and Domestic, Henry VIII. Um, It is true, he received lots. He received keeperships, manors, all kinds of things. And he managed to hang on to his post in the King's Privy Chamber through Cardinal Wolsey's 1526 purge. Cardinal Wolsey, um, with his Eltham ordinances, um, tried to remove young men who he thought weren't a good influence on the king. So he did a purge of the privy chamber. He did some reforming of it. Um, But Carey was one of the ones that managed to hang on to his post. So that's taken as, you know, that Carey, you know, the king was kind of rewarding him. Like the king made sure that he kept his post. But William Carey was related to the king and he was a royal favourite. He also was not an unusual case in receiving all these grants and awards. If you look through the lists of grants from Henry VIII's reign, and I've done this uh, because actually I find it very, very interesting, you see the same names coming up over and over again. Favoured courtiers received grants and offices. We have Sir Henry Norris, who, you know, fell in 1536 in in Anne Boleyn's fall and was executed. Um, he, at this time, at the same time as William Carey was around, was um, gentleman, a gentleman of the Privy Chamber. He also survived Cardinal Wolsey's purge, and he was actually promoted. He was promoted to groom of the stool because William Compton um, died, sadly. So Henry Norris took over. He also, his name comes up in the lists all the time. He received a host of grants, keepships and offices. 
But I've never seen, and perhaps I'm missing something here, but I have never seen any suggestion by historians that Henry VIII had an affair with Henry Norris's wife, Mary Fiennes, um, or that her children, who were born at similar times to the Carey children, 1524 and 1526, were fathered by the king. So why is there this suggestion, just because we know that Mary Boleyn slept with the king at some time, why is there suge this suggestion that these grants and offices are payments for the use of his wife and for fathering his children, when Henry Norris is a very similar case? It is clear from the lists of grants that we see in Henry VIII's reign that Henry VIII was extraordinarily generous to those who were close to him, those who served him, and those who served him loyally. He was generous to them. And William Carey was in his privy chamber and served him loyally. So if we're to say that repeated rewards to the same person are evidence of provisions for children, then Henry VIII had an awful lot of illegitimate children by women at his court. And I don't believe that at all. Now, I want us to think about another of Henry VIII's mistresses, Elizabeth Blunt, or Bessie Blunt, as she's quite often called. Now, she was one of Catherine of Aragon's uh, maids of honour, and we know that she had a sexual relationship with the king. We know this because in 1519, she gave birth to a son who became known as Henry Fitzroy, and the king acknowledged her son as his and he gave him dukedoms, and it was widely known that her son was fathered by the king. Now, historian Elizabeth Norton, and I'm actually going to give you a link in the description to this video uh, to her article on the Anne Boleyn Files site, Elizabeth Norton believes that Bessie's daughter, Elizabeth, was also fathered by the king. She was born in around 1520, because it appears that she was born before Bessie's marriage, her subsequent marriage. So I'll give you a link to read about that. Now, we know that Cardinal Wolsey arranged a marriage for Bessie uh, when the king had finished with her. So this makes me think about Mary Boleyn and whether the king had an MO. Um, you know, did, did the king sleep with someone, get tired of the affair, finish with them, and then, you know, get them married off, uh, arrange a good marriage for them. It's possible, isn't it, that Mary Boleyn is exactly the same as Bessie Blunt. The king sleeps with her before her marriage to William Carey in 1520, and then arranges this marriage for her with one of his relatives, William Carey, and, and a man who served in his privy chamber. It was a good match for Mary Boleyn. And the king attended their wedding in February 1520. So I do wonder if it was arranged on the orders of the king. Now that is just my opinion. And I'm saying that straight, that is my opinion. But I think, you know, if it happened with Bessie Blunt, then it could well have happened with Mary Boleyn. And perhaps Henry VIII slept with Mary Boleyn when Bessie was pregnant in 1519, when she was out of action. So it's plausible. But all we know for sure, the only fact that we have about the relationship is that they had a sexual relationship at some point. Very, very frustrating. Now, as for theories regarding Henry VIII being the father of Mary's children, Catherine and Henry, these are just theories, and we will never know unless we dig up all their remains and you know, look at the DNA. There is just no firm evidence to back them up because Henry VIII didn't acknowledge them. So it's just, they're just theories. There were rumours that Henry Carey was the king's son, that he looked like the king, but the king didn't acknowledge him. Carey, Henry Carey didn't claim to be Elizabeth I's half-brother later on in his life. And it could well be that the rumours were just another way of blackening the Boleyns, and because it was known that Mary Boleyn slept with the king at some point. 
Now, Elizabeth I was close to the Careys. That's another, you know, thing that people used. You know, oh, she was really close to them. She gave them really lavish funerals. Um, you know, they were like royal funerals. But we have to remember that even though they may not have been her half-siblings, they were her cousins. They were her mother's sister's children. They served her loyally all their lives. Elizabeth's pre-accession household, uh, you know, when she was a girl um, and, you know, a young woman, had a number of Boleyn relatives in it. She appears to have placed great importance on family ties. And at no point did Elizabeth ever suggest that the Careys were more than her cousins. I've also, that it has been said, you know, that Henry VIII provided for Catherine, for Catherine Carey, that he provided her with a dowry. Well, this is all sort of based on the grants um, that, you know, William Carey received, which I've already discussed. And I have found no evidence of him providing a dowry for Catherine or providing for the Carey children a, a, at all, apart from the fact that um, he granted Mary Boleyn an annuity that had once been paid to her husband. And he did that after Mary had appealed to Thomas Cromwell for financial assistance. She'd been banished from court for secretly marrying William Stafford. She'd had her allowance cut off by her father, Thomas Boleyn, because the family were, you know, seething. They were angry that she'd married without their permission. And so she'd approached Thomas Cromwell and she'd been granted this annuity. Um, but she certainly wasn't alone in being granted an annuity that had once been her husband's. Um, I did some, some digging um, and found examples of widows of yeomen of the crown in Henry VIII's reign being given assistance after you know, their, their husbands had served him as yeomans of the crown yeomans the Yemen warders, um, and, you know, had died, they needed financial assistance, so they were also granted annuities. As I said, Mary's first husband had been a member of the king's privy chamber. He had served the king loyally, so why shouldn't the king help his widow and pass on that annuity that he'd once paid to William Carey? So were Catherine and Henry Carey fathered by Henry VIII? Well, yes, quite possibly. Um, they, they could have been fathered by the man they knew as their father as well, William Carey. It is just this big question mark. Now, it is often said, and we see this coming up in fiction and in movies, that Anne Boleyn adopted Henry Carey after William Carey's death. Um, and that it was because, you know, he was the king's son and she hadn't had a son yet. So she kind of takes Henry Carey away from Mary Boleyn and sort of makes him hers. Well, how can I put this politely? But that is complete codswallop, poppycock. Um, Anne Boleyn, um, at this time, when William Carey died in 1528, Anne Boleyn, was had accepted the king's proposal of marriage she was like his queen in waiting she was going to be queen she was his sweetheart and Anne Boleyn was granted the wardship of Henry Carey after William Carey's death so that she could help her sister so that she could alleviate the financial burden on Mary Boleyn now, children of importance and noble families were often sent away from their family to be brought up and educated by a family that were a little bit further up the social ladder. Sending your child to be educated in a household such as that, um, a more prestigious family, or to serve in their household, was seen as beneficial. It was, it was giving your child a step up the ladder like sending your child to finishing school. Um, it was to give them sort of benefits that might help their later career. And wardships were a more formal way of doing this. The wardship of a child could be purchased 
buy it or it could be granted you. And in exchange for sort of taking on that child and having them come into your household and that's educating them, in return for that, the, the owner of the wardship would af- often have control of the child's property and any revenue that was coming in, you know, rents and things, any revenue that was earned until that child reached their majority. And also the holder of the wardship might also be in charge of arranging a marriage for them and perhaps with their own son or daughter to kind of keep the ward's revenue in the family. Examples of wards in uh, the Tudor times, we have Lady Jane Grey, who um, you know was the daughter of uh, Francis Brandon and Henry Grey, Duke of Suffolk. She was the ward of Thomas Seymour, who was married to Catherine Parr at the time. You have Catherine Willoughby uh, becoming Charles Brandon's ward, and she was meant to marry his son, but then actually Charles Brandon decided to marry her instead. Um, So those two examples. And then, of course, Henry Carey becoming Anne's ward. Anne took financial responsibility for little Henry to help her sister. And she was also in charge of organising his education, which she did by employing um, the French reformer and scholar Nicolas Bourbon to teach the boy. She was giving him a step up. She was taking the pressure of her sister and giving Henry Carey a step up the kind of the social ladder. She didn't adopt him. She didn't take him as her own. She was simply helping out her family. And there's no evidence that she did this because he was the king's son. The king really doesn't come into it. There's no acknowledgement. And that's just a really big leap to kind of say that. So I kind of come to the end of this first kind of part um, looking at myths and suppositions and theories leaving you with more questions than answers, I kind of feel. But that really is the conundrum that is Mary Boleyn. There are far more questions than answers with Mary Boleyn and her life. And you can understand why she is the perfect subject for a historical novelist. Um, There are just so many possibilities with her life story. And we we often can't say, well, that didn't happen, um, because it could have. So the puzzle that is Mary Boleyn. So next time I'll be looking at other theories, other myths, things that have that are very prevalent that people, you know, believe that actually might not have much basis in history. So I'll leave you leave you there and I'll be back with another part on Mary Boleyn quite soon. I hope you've enjoyed this video. You can subscribe to this channel with I think a button round about there and you could always uh, click on the bell as well to receive notifications of new videos. Um, I'm doing On This Day in Tudor History videos every day for 2019, so lots of videos coming. And of course, I'm going to carry on with Mary Boleyn and also Anne Boleyn questions. I will see you soon. I'm Claire Ridgeway and thank you for joining me. Take care.